Agora vai. Ok. So, let me re-switch to English. So, welcome back to the second part of our event. It's uh, the second session of the day. We will have another session. So, this one is from 2 to uh, 4 p.m. Then we will have another session in the afternoon from 15, 17 to 6.30. Okay. So, uh, Thanks again for being here, and uh, let me introduce your second keynote speaker, which is Professor Domingos Faria. So, Domingos holds a PCT junior research position at the Center of Philosophy at the University of G de Lisboa, the University of Laos, where he is working on a project entitled The Epistemology of Complex Disagreement Among Social Groups. He earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Lisbon, from the University of G de Lisboa, no, in 2017, which a thesis entitled Is Belief in God Properly Necessary? Defense of a Moderate Inferentialism. His primary areas of research are epistemology and philosophy of religion, and he works also in philosophy of logic, metaphysics, and uh, the philosophy and uh, the teaching of philosophy. So his talk of today is called Knowledge First, Reform the Epistemology. Please welcome Professor Dominguez. Thank you, Dominguez. Yes. Thank you a lot. I will share my screen. Okay. I will share my screen. Please let me know if you see the screen. If my if you see my slides. It works. It's working. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I can see it. Okay, great. I will start then. So my talk is about knowledge first from my epistemology. So I want to relate the knowledge first epistemology like uh, Timothy Williams and developing his book, uh, The Knowledge and Its Limits, with the reformed epistemology uh, that Pantinga, Alvin Pantinga developed in, um, in his uh, book, uh, Warrant and Christian belief. So let's start with my introduction. So I want to relate to trending topics in uh, contemporary epistemology. Namely, I want to dis relate the discussion about knowledge first epistemology with the discussion of the performative epistemology approach. So I want to relate uh, knowledge first epistemology with reformed epistemology. I want to underline that in uh, uh, religious epistemology, no one has yet seriously applied and developed Timothy Williamson theory of knowledge first epistemology. So uh, in this talk, I want to analyze what consequence Timothy Williamson theory as for uh, religious epistemology. So I, wa I want to develop uh, uh, um, a reformed epistemology based on uh, this book, based on uh, knowledge first uh, approach. Furthermore, uh, we want to argue that reformed epistemology need not be associated with planting a proper functionalism uh, theory and with a reductive epistemology that says that knowledge is reductible to warrant true belief. Uh, I think that we can deny the proper functionalist theory, we can deny that knowledge is a warrant true belief, and we, we co can continue to hold a reformed epistemology. We can continue to develop a reformed epistemology without uh, the proper functionalist theory as planting uh, uh, holds. Thus, in this talk, we uh, can develop a reformed epistemology in a non-reductive way, as uh, Timothy Williamson proposed in his book, Knowledge and Its Limits. So what is my plan? <clears throat> my plan is the following. I want to start to develop a knowledge first epistemology. After that, uh, I want to, to see what is the main thesis of reformed epistemology. 
And my last point is about knowledge first for med epistemology. So I want to develop a reformed epistemology based on knowledge first approach as Timothy Willens developed. And uh, finally, I, I developed some kind of conclusions. So let's start with the second point, knowledge first epistemology. What is knowledge first epistemology? In, in, in this second point, I will follow the main topics of uh, knowledge and the, its limits books. And uh, Timothy Williamson in these books argues that the concept knows cannot be analyzable into more basic concepts such as belief, true, and justification. So we, we cannot reduce knowledge to more basic elements like belief, true, and justification. Instead, knowledge is prior to the other epistemic gains. The concept of knowing uh, being a theoretical primitive. So knowing is a primitive concept. In other words, for, according to Timothy Williamson, Knowledge is a starting point for explaining other notions. We can analyze and explain belief, justification, evidence, assertion by reference to knowledge. So we can explain different epistemic properties by reference to knowledge. For instance, we can say that believing a proposition P is grossly treating P as if one knows P. Or we can say that a belief is fully justified if only if it constitutes knowledge. And we can also say that all the all only uh, knowledge is uh, evidence. So we can uh, define, we can uh, characterize and analyze belief, justification, evidence, and so on, in terms of knowledge, because knowledge is a theoretical primitive. So, what are the main arguments to, to this approach? What are the main reasons to, to, to support this view? According to, to Timothy Williamson, the main reasons for supporting this approach, in which knowledge is central uh, uh, concept, are the following. First, not all concepts are susceptible to analysis in terms of more basic, necessary and sufficient conditions, at least in a non-trivial and non-secular man manner. So we cannot propose for all concepts uh, necessary and sufficient conditions. And according to Timothy Williamson, this seems to happen with several common concepts, like the concept red. We cannot present the necessary and sufficient conditions to the concept of uh, red, or for the concept of hip, bald, tall, old, etc., so, and so on. But also with the concept of knowledge, we cannot also, we cannot present necessary and sufficient uh, conditions. So, against the, the orthodoxy, it seems that there aren't non-circular, necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge, just as there aren't such non-circular conditions for analyzing, uh, for example, the, con the, the color red or the, the concept of gold. So, in our daily life, in our daily life, there are a lot of concepts in which we do not have necessary and sufficient conditions. So it is normal that for the concept of knowledge, we do not also have necessary and sufficient uh, conditions. According to, to Timothy Williamson, this is confirmed intuitively by the continued failure to solve the Gettier problem for a for a succession of increasingly complex analyses have been overturned by increasingly complex counterexamples. 
as uh, Willens underlined. So, always that we present, um, always that we present um, necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge, it is always possible to offer uh, counterexamples to, to such a knowledge. So, the project of an, uh, an, uh, to give an, an analysis of knowledge in terms of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions fails, fails always, according to, to Timothy Willison. But now we can have an uh, important point here, because although knowledge cannot be analyzable in and reducible to more basic components, a sufficient informative characterization of knowledge can be present. So even if we do not have necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge, we can offer um, a, a positive or a, a good characterization of, uh, of knowledge. According to Timothy Willinson proposal, it is the Dillinson proposal is to give a positive and externalistic understanding of knowledge as a state of mind. Knowledge is a state of mind. More precisely, he holds that knowing is the most general affective stative attitude that which one has to a proposition if one has any effective stative uh, attitude to it at all. In other words, we can say that knowledge is the most general uh, effective mental state. Knowledge is the most general effective mental state. That is the most general attitude that one can have to true positions only. I need to do some clarifications in order to better understand what it means to say that knowledge is the most uh, general affective mental state. The first characterization or clarification that I, that I want to do is the following. Knowledge is merely a state of mind, namely there is a mental state such as being in that state is a necessary and a sufficient condition for knowing B. So knowledge is merely and a purely mental state. Consequently, contrary to the orthodox approach, knowledge is not a hybrid of mental, like belief, and no mental elements, like truth. Thus, knowledge is not a conjunction. Knowledge, according to Timothy Williams, is not a conjunction of belief, the mental component, the truth, the non-mental component, and something else, like justification and warrant. So, instead of it, knowledge is a purely mental state. Knowledge purely is a mental state, given its resemblance to other mental states. And this understanding of knowledge as a mere state of mind is a presupposition that uh, we must accept unless we have a powerful uh, reason to re reject it. The second clarification that I want to do is the following. Unlike mental states like imagining, desiring, hoping, and so on, the mental state of knowing is factive. It's factive in the sense that implies the truth of the proposition. So, affective attitude is one that a subject S can have only to truth. For, from the proposition S knows that P, we can valid it, uh, in a valid way deduce that P is true. Uh, so, the fact that knowledge is affective attitude does not prevent it from uh, being a mental state. We can have affective mental states, according to Timothy Williamson. As Timothy Williams pointed out, affective attitudes have so many similarities to non-affective attitudes that we should expect them to constitute uh, mental states uh, as well. 
namely this effective dimension of mental states must be understood in the light of an externalistic approach according to which mental states can depend on the external world. And if that is possible, if externalism is true, we can say that it is possible that we can have effective mental states. So for this reason, the sense of such effective mental states includes a matching between the mind and the world. That is my second uh, clarification. <clears throat> And the last clarification, the third and final clarification that I want to do is the following. Knowing, knowing is not just effective mental state, but the most general of that kind. Because the other effective mental states, like perceiving that P or remember that P, imply knowing that P. So we can have other effective mental states like seeing that P or perceiving that P or remember that P that imply the knowledge that P. In other words, uh, um, the other effective mental states imply the true of their content because they entail knowledge. For example, if a subject has really see that it is raining, then the, the subject S knows that it is raining because knowledge is factive. So uh, there are uh, the several specific ways in which one can know, such as seeing, uh, remember, and uh, perceiving, and so on. And uh, Ilian, Timothy Williamson uh, seeks to elucidate this idea more formally, uh, showing that in natural uh, thought, uh, uh, effective uh, mental state operator, we can express such a effective attitude through a natural language with a effective mental state operator, which is semantically analyzable. The central point of effective mental state operator can be summarized as follows. So first, knowledge or no is a effective mental state operator and if phi for example if perceiving is a effective mental state operator then from s phi that p for example from s perceiving or if from s sees that p one can infer both that p is true and s knows that uh, p that is to, to the the main point that uh, Timothy Williamson developed. And this allowed us to capture the idea uh, that uh, um, knowing as the most uh, general effective mental state. So according to Timothy Williamson, knowledge is the most general effective mental state because other um, effective mental states like perceiving that P or remember that P or seeing that P imply knowledge that P. And for the sake of our argument, uh, uh, let us take uh, this approach for granted. So I will assume that this approach is mainly correct. So let's summarize the, this point. So summarizing knowledge first epistemology, I want to underline only this. Knowledge is the most general affective mental state. Knowing is merely a state of mind. Contrary to orthodox approach, knowing is not a hybrid of mental and non-mental ailments. Unlike uh, mental states like imagining, desiring, hoping, the mental state of knowing is factive, and the effective attitude is one that the subject has can have only to true. And the last clarification is that knowing is not just effective mental state, but the most general of that kind, in the sense that the other effective mental states, like perceiving that P or remember that P, imply knowing that P. So that is the general approach to knowledge for epistemology, in the sense that knowledge is the most general effective mental state. That is the first part of my talk. So let's go to the second part of my talk. What is 
reformed epistemology. What is reformed epistemology? The main thesis of uh, reformed epistemology is the thesis that theistic belief can be properly basic. That is the main thesis. What is a basic belief? We can say that a basic uh, a belief P at time T is basic for the person F, S, if only if that proposition P at T is such that it is accepted by the subject S, but not on the basis of any argument or influence. So a basic belief is a belief that a subject accepts that belief without argument. What is a properly basic belief? A properly basic belief is defined as follows. A belief P at time T is properly basic for the person S, if only if uh, that, that belief P is base, a basic belief at T for S, so that P is a basic belief, and we have another condition in order to be a proper basic belief. In other words, such a belief, such a proposition, has positive epistemic status, like justification, warrant, knowledge, or so on, a T for S. So, a proper basic belief is a belief that is basic, but it is also uh, a belief that is justified or uh, we, we, which have warrant or uh, a belief that is knowledge. So what is mean what it means to say that a theistic belief can be properly basic? It means that a theistic belief can have a positive epistemic state like justification or or warrant without argument or influence. In other words, according to the reformed epistemology, it, it is possible that this belief uh, has positive epistemic status, even if there isn't any successful theistic argument, such as the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, the, the theological argument, and so on. So we can have a basic belief and uh, uh, with uh, positive epistemic status without uh, a su successful uh, theistic argument. Which, uh, uh, now we have the following uh, question. Why can uh, this belief be properly basic? How can um, uh, belief in God have a positive epistemic status without arguments? According to um, to Alvin Plantinga in the book uh, um, Warrant and Christian Belief, Plantinga argued that uh, this belief can have a positive epistemic states of warrant. And what is warrant? Warrant is whatever it, uh, uh, whatever it is that makes the difference between knowledge and mere true belief. So we need to ask, what is uh, that which fills the gap between mere true belief and knowledge. What, what makes the difference between true belief and knowledge? And in order to answer that such question, Plantinga developed and held a proper functionalist theory of warrant. And the, the main point of such theory is the following. Uh, according to, to Alvin Planting, a, a belief P as warrant for a, a person F, S, if only if first P is produced in S by cognitive faculties functionally, functioning properly. In other words, subject to no dysfunction. So this is the proper uh, function condition. The second condition is the following. P is formed in appropriate epistemic environment one sufficiently similar to that for which S cognitive faculties were designed. And this is the environmental condition. The third condition is the following. S cognitive faculties which produce P are operating according to a design plan reliably aimed at through the, uh, rather than some other cognitive goal. And this is the reliability condition. And the last condition is the non-defeater condition that says that S 
the subject S has no defeaters for, for the, the belief uh, P. So that is the, the planting a theory of uh, warrant, the proper functionalism theory of uh, warrant. Now, if the proper functionalist theory of warrant is correct, how can this belief uh, have warrant in a basic way? And the, the planting argument can be summarized in this way. He, he's, he said the following, if this belief is true, then there is indeed such a person as God, a person who has created in his image who love us, who desire that we know and love him. But if these things are so, then we would, of course, intend that we be able to be aware of his presence and to know something about him. And given that God would certainly want us to be able to know him, the chances are excellent that he Old create us with faculties like the sensus divinitatis, <laughs> enabling us to do just that, to, to know God or to be a warrant about God. So the planting argument can be summarized in this way. First premise, if God exists, then God loves us, desire that we know and love him. If God loves us, desire that we know and love him, then God probably wants us to know something about him. And if God probably wants us to know something about him, then God probably creates us with faculties, for example, the sensus divinitatis faculties, uh, that functioning, functioning properly in an appropriate circumstance generates true beliefs about God. And if God probably creates us with such faculties like sensus divinitatis, then belief in God is probably warranted. So we we have that the the main conclusion. Therefore, if God exists, then belief in God is probably warranted. And such a conclusion five also serves to to answer the jury objection, like uh, objection formulated by by Freud and Marx, which says that belief in God does not have a positive epistemic status even if there is a, a, a God. However, if planting is right and if it is correct to say that if God exists, then belief in God is probably warranted, we can conclude that the de jure objection is not a good objection. So, uh, with such an argument, planting uh, have a good uh, uh, objection to Freud and uh, Marx and uh, similar uh, objections. So, let's summarize the main point. According to Reformed epistemology, if God exists, then belief in God probably has uh, a positive extent status, like warrant, in a basic way. According to, Timo, to, uh, according to Alvin Plantinga, according to Alvin Plantinga, this natural knowledge of God is not arrived at by inference or arguments. For example, the famous theistic proofs of natural theology, but in a mu much more immediate way. Uh, these beliefs about God just arise within us. They are occasioned by circumstances. They are not conclusions from them. In this regard, the sense of divinity this resembles perception, memory, and a priori beliefs. So that is the main point of Reformed epistemology, which says that we can have um, a basic belief in God's existence without uh, arguments for the existence of God. That is the main point. So let's go to my uh, final part of my talk, in, in which I want to relate the knowledge first epistemology with uh, reformed epistemology. I want to make the relation and to defend the reformed epistemology 
this is without the proper functionalist theory of a warrant that planting a proposal. So, first, I want to first I want to underline <coughs> that uh, reformed epistemology is typically associated with planting a proper functionalist theory. That is the the main association that we have that uh, reformed epistemology is normally associated with planting a proper functionalistic theory. However, it can be argued that planting a theory of proper functionalism is not plausible because, for example, we can show that proper functionalist theory is susceptible to get a problem. There are a lot of uh, get your problems to, to proper functionalism. For example, we have uh, such uh, an, uh, a case, a get your case, that shows that uh, the theory of a wa warrant that planting a purpose is not good. Uh, such a uh, case is formulated by Peter Klein. Peter Klein says the following, don't believe that she owns a well-functioning form. She forms this belief in a perfect normal circumstances using her cognitive equipment that is functioning just perfectly. But as sometimes normally happens, no decisions here on no to Jones, effort is it and virtually the most leash. Let's say while uh, it is parked outside the air office, but also on uh, knowing to, to Jones, she has just one um, uh, well-functioning form in, in the uh, L-functioning for lottery that their company runs on a year. So in this case, we can show that um, all conditions for a rent that putting a proposal are satisfied. In this case, the Jones have cognitive faculties that are working properly in good normal conditions and so on. The cognitive capacities of Jones are reliable and so on. So we can say that all conditions of uh, warrant are satisfied in this case, but uh, such a case is not a case of knowledge. So we have a GTA problem against uh, planting. Another way to, to argue is that given uh, Williamson arguments, all reductive models of knowledge, such as one proposed by Plantinga, fail. So Plantinga says that knowledge is understood in terms of warrant through belief. But according to Timothy Williamson, knowledge is not reducible to a more basic component. So we cannot say that the knowledge is could be able to warrant truth and belief. But if planting a proper functionalist theory fails, does this mean that the thesis of reformed epistemology also fails? And the answer is no. We can continue to hold the reformed epistemology thesis without the proper Functionalist theory of warrant that of implanting a developed. So, in order to support the thesis of reformed epistemology, we need not to defend the proper functionalist theory or a reductive model of knowledge, uh, because it is possible to argue that uh, to argue for the reformed epistemology thesis on the basis of a non reductive model of knowledge, such as uh, that advocated by uh, Timothy Willison in his book, Knowledge and its Limits. Namely, if Timothy Willison's approach to knowledge first is correct, we can say, uh, and it can be argued, that the belief in God can be properly basic. And such a, a task uh, can be done by drawing an uh, analogy with perception. So now, right now, I will apply and develop uh, the 
formatic epistemology thesis with basis of knowledge first epistemology and knowledge first approach. So let's see the point. According to knowledge first epistemology, perceiving that P is a way of knowing that P. So perceiving that it is raining is a way to know that it is raining. So it is knowledge that P acquired via the perception of entities in one environment. Another point is that perception, according to knowledge for epistemology, provides knowledge, namely it provides perceptual evidence and introspective evidence. However, hallucination does not provide, provide such perceptual knowledge, at most uh, just it provides uh, introspective evidence. So we need to make the distinction between good cases and bad cases. In bad cases, like hallucination, bad cases provide only knowledge uh, of uh, propositions about how things seem to us. So we have only the phenomenal experience in bad cases. But in the good cases, in which there is really perception, provides knowledge of propositions about the environment in which one is directly experiencing. So, if you say that evidence equals to knowledge like Timothy Williamson, so we can say that we have more evidence or knowledge when we perceive them when we hallucination. So it is the best, oh, it is, uh, uh, it is, in a good case, we have more, we have more knowledge than in a, a bad case. We have more positive uh, epistemic states in a good case than uh, in a bad case. Now, following a knowledge first religious epistemology, it can be said and it can be argued that if there is a God who loves us, who want us to know and love him, then God probably creates us with a disposition to have effective mental state of religious perception. So we can say that if there is a God, so it is probable that God creates us with, with a disposition to have effective mental state of religious perception similar to ordinary perception. So let's call such a effective mental state of religious perception as numing that P. Numing that P comes from the, the word pneuma, is, which is the Greek for spirit. So when a person has a religious experience, if there is a God, such a person can have a new meaning that there is a God. So, new meaning that P is similar to perceiving that P or remember that P in the sense that each of these cases are effective mental states and thus each of them implies knowledge. So, if in, in a religious experience some persons uh, have a new meaning that P, so such a person uh, knows that P. So if the person uh, have a new meaning, have a, a mental, effective mental state of new meaning that there is a God, so such a person have uh, knowledge that uh, God exists. So if God exists, then there may be circumstance like circumstance like praying, reading the Bible, or seeing the the beautiful beauty of nature and so on, in which the subjects form the effective mental state of knowing that there is uh, a God. And now we have the question, and what if there is no God? <laughs> what if there is no God? In such a case, if there is no God, there is no effective mental state of knowing that there is a God. But in such a bad case, 
the religious person can continue to have knowledge of propositions about how things seem to work. Uh, that is the internal phenomenology in a good and bad case is the same. So the internal phenomenology or phenomenology or the internal evidence is the same. So even if in the bad case the religious person does not uh, know that there is a God, she may be excusable, she may be excusable to have the belief in the existence of God, given that she believes as things seems to her and she has no defeaters. So she can have the, the positive epistemic states of excusable but not the epistemic positive state of of, um, of knowledge. To conclude, so we can say the following. It can be argued that in the bad cases in, in which there is no God, the religious person believing in God is properly basic to a minimal degree because such a belief may have the, the epistemic states of excusable but not the, the epistemic states of knowledge. So, in order to conclude, let me summarize my main point. My main point of uh, knowledge for form of epistemology. We can distinguish between good cases and bad cases. We can distinguish between good cases and bad cases. In a good cases, in which there is a God, uh, we can say that there is effective mental state of naming that there is a God. And if a subject has, if a person is naming that there is a God, then uh, given that naming is effective mental state, we can say that uh, the subject as such a person knows that there is a God. So in, in this case, in this good case, we can conclude that the basic belief can be properly basic. So according to uh, uh, knowledge first, reform and epistemology, we can say that this belief can be properly basic, having the epistemic states of knowledge, the maximum degree of positive epistemic states. But on the other hand, <clears throat> we have the bad cases, the bad cases in which there is no God. <clears throat> so in bad cases, we can say that there is no effective mental state of new meaning that there is a God. And even so, we can say, or we can defend that a religious person can be excused for, uh, can be excused at least for continuing to believe in God without argument, insofar as she has no defeaters and believes as and thinks seems to her. So if such a person has the phenomenology and the the religious experience, and if such a person have no defeaters, it can be excused for such a person to continue to, to believe in God without argument. So the conclusion in, in bad cases is the following. So the taste belief can be properly basic to a minimal degree, having the, the epistemic states of excuse uh, or epistemic states of excusable, but not the epistemic states of knowledge. So, that is the point. We can argue for a, a, a reformed epistemology uh, thesis based on um, a knowledge first epistemology, and we can distinguish good cases and bad cases. In a good case, we can say that uh, belief in God can be properly basic, having the knowledge, and in bad cases, uh, this belief can be uh, properly basic in a minimal degree, being such a belief excusable. So, thank you a lot for listening to me. Thanks a lot, Domingos. I mean, pretty interesting and useful as well, especially for someone who is not familiar with either or both the Reformed Epistemology Project and the Knowledge yeah. First Project. So 
Thanks a lot. So, questions? Okay, we have a first question, Felipe Medeiros. Domingo, uh, para Hi. o compartilhamento, por favor. Ah, sim. Sí. Okay. Okay, we have Felipe first, then... Hey, Domingos, uh, can you hear me? You can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I think you got everything exactly right with regards to how we would transpose performed epistemology to like knowledge force epistemology. It's just like we just want to translate an external account. It's an externalist account to the other account, right? And yeah. everything there seems fine. This is just like what we would do if we want to translate it. I want to prod a little bit on the notion of excuse, though. So, okay. uh, uh, so, so on, on knowledge first epistemology, we have this big debate about what it is that it means to be excused, right? And, and I think the core of the debate is about whether this is an ep a positive epistemic status or, or not. And, and I, I, I'm used to thinking that it isn't, <laughs> right? It's just a matter of not violating conventional norms and, and when yeah. we translate that talk to when we translate that talk to like how other epistemologists talk we talk about like being rational or you know being in a being in the evil demo world but you, you yeah. didn't do nothing wrong so we use all this like talk about not being in certain negative states right but we don't yeah. ascribe anything positive to it yeah i see uh, and here, it seems like you want to say something more than that. It's, it, it seems like you want to say that that's an epi a positive epistemic status in some sense. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit about, about more that, and, and especially what would be the value of that, aside from yeah. like not violating norms or something like that, if, if there's any, something more going on, or, or, or we're just talking about the same thing here. Yeah. Great, great uh, question. Th thanks a lot, Philip, for your question. So, I want to 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 make uh, a similar point that uh, the knowledge first epistemology do in order to reply to evil genius or evil demon problem. So, in an evil demon problem, we have a bad case. Yeah. We have a bad case. And in, in such a bad case, what Timothy Williams say? In, in such a bad case, Timothy Williams said that we have an excuse to continue to believe in what we believe. So we do not have knowledge, but we can continue to, to have knowledge. You, you are excusable to, to, to violate such a norm. And I think, in my perspective, such a such a excusable is have at least some positive epistemic status in the sense that it is something is a, a course of action that is permitted to the to the subject the subject can so the subject is not um, the subject is not uh, uh, doing something uh, very wrong in the sense that he has such an excusable to do that. So my point is only to have the, a similar point related with the evil demon uh, genius or evil demon world in which Timothy Williams said that we have a excusable maneuver to, to, to reply to such a case. And I think we can do the same in a form of the epistemology. If there, is a, if there is no God, we can say that the, the persons that believe in God can, can continue to believe in God in a basic way, because they may be excusable to, to do that if they do not have uh, the features. My, my point is that so the degree of the epistemic status is very low. 
<laughs> it's very low, Philip. So the degree of epistemic status in bad cases is very low. That is my point. But I think it's not a negative epistemic status. It's a positive but very low uh, degree of positive epistemic right. status. Can I say something real quick? The, just yeah, okay, yeah. So, so one way to try to frame this issue is that some people will say something like, well, that's a status about the believer, not about the belief, right? Okay, okay uh, I see. And, I, and I'm wondering if that distinction does some work here or not. Like. And I, I'm excused, it's something about my action, but it's not necessarily about my belief. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if that's the case, then there is, if that's the case, then there's nothing going on to say about the belief in that case. And that's the yeah. Point. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense for me. Thank you for that. I, yeah, I will try to, 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 make, to make that more clear. Because I agree with that, is the action that is exclusive to to this, the to the subject. Yes, that is point. Yeah. Thank you a lot, Rodrigo. Uh, Philip, sorry. Turn on your mic. Thanks, I'm sorry, uh, you still. Uh... Okay, I think we have another couple of questions. Gabriel, then we have Agnaldo. Uh, I can see clearly again, I can see Agnaldo, but uh, there was another question before. Gabriel, okay, let's go. Agnaldo, please go ahead. All right. So thank you, Domingo, very you. much. Nice to see you again. Me, nice to see. You. Yeah. And um, thank you for your talk. Um, I have an impression about this um, first approach. Mm -hmm. It says uh, it's non-analyzable. The concept of knowledge of knowledge is non-analyzable, but yeah. it keeps on analyzing it. <laughs> in fact, it's active, it's believed, that's true, but I don't know, uh, maybe I'm wrong, I'm probably wrong, but I have, I have this impression that uh, it's, it's very difficult to analyze it, and uh, probably we will, we will fail every time, but it's, I think it's inevitable, but that's not my main question, I would like to hear you about that. Uh, but uh, my, my question is that the famous um, remark uh, Richard Swinburne made to Alvin Plantinga's book back in 2001. Well, uh, if the, the, we are warranted yeah. in, in the, the belief in God, if there is a God, how can we know there is yeah. a God? Yeah, that is does your approach change anything about this question or does can it answer that question better than the than Plantinga's reform of the yeah. epistemology? Yeah. Great question, uh, Agnaldo. Thank you. Thank you a lot for that. Thank you a lot for that. So the first question I want to want only to stress the the following uh, the following by idea. Uh, it is true that according to Timothy Williamson, knowledge is not analyzable, but he accepts that we can propose necessary conditions, not sufficient conditions. So according to Timothy Williamson, we can give and propose necessary conditions for knowledge. For example, Timothy Williamson accepts the, the, the safety condition for, for knowledge. And uh, so he, he proposed as well a necessary condition for, for knowledge. However, he do not accept sufficient conditions to analyze knowledge. So because we have the, the problem, the Gettier problem and, and so on. Concerning, 
Concerning the, the second question, concerning the second question, I, I think my proposal can have some kind of uh, advantage uh, related to the pro to planting a proposal because in my proposal in my account I distinguish between uh, bad cases and good cases and I say that even the subject is in in a bad case in which there is no God the subject can continue to have uh, a positive extent states of excuse so even if there is no God the subject can have a proper belief, a uh, basic proper belief in the existence of God, even if the, such a positive extent state is in a low degree because it is a mere, a mere uh, ex excuse. So uh, I, I think that is uh, that is an advantage of my view because. We can say that even if there is no God, the belief in God can be properly basic in a some kind of low level of the positive epistemic states of of excuse. Thank you a lot. Thank you. But the question was not that. The question you, is Martina. how can we know there is a God? Or not. Yeah, 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 that is a problem, of course, that is a problem, <laughs> that is a problem, and uh, in such a way, uh, this, the reformed epistemology do, do not have a clear answer to it. it uh, in this point, I agree with Richard Swinburne. Uh, yeah, the, the natural theology can have some kind of role, but it is not mandatory for my mother to, to know the ontological argument in order for her to believe in God. I do not mandate or um, that my mother need to, to know the ontological argument or the theological argument and so on. My mother need not to know anything about the ontological arguments in, in order to believe in God. And so I think reformed epistemology can give some kind of contribute in this way. You need the evidence anyway. Yeah, that is true. That is true. But in other sense, in order to common people, ordinary people to believe in God, they do not need to have such evidence. They do not need to have, uh, uh, they do not have to know the ontological argument. My mother need not know the ontological argument in order to believe in God. That does not make sense. That is the point. Thank you, Domingos. I don't want to polarize the, the debate. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but, well, but, but, thank you very but, much. Yeah, but I want only to stress and to underline that I agree that the, the, the natural theology has some kind of role, but it is does not make sense to mandate or to oblige every people to, to know the ontological argument in order to to believe in God, to have some kind of positive extended states, or in order to believe in God to be rational. That does not make sense. Okay. We have another, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Aguinaldo. If you have another question from Felipe Moreira. Ah, there is also a commentary. If there is not a problem, it's an ontological problem. The point means the planting, I know there is epistemological. Okay, yeah. so Felipe, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, assuming that belief in God is basic, I think if that's the case, you have an answer to the atheist. But I'm wondering, how would you deal with disputes mm. between distinct religious people? Yeah. Because uh, assuming that belief in God is basic, well, 
get all kinds of conceptions of God, right? So how would you deal with, say, person one who has so-and-so concept of God, maybe relying on traditional Christianity, and then person two who has so-and-so concept of God more closely related to the Islamic conception. When they run into a dispute, how would you uh, try to deal? Because, of course, merely claiming that belief in God is based not going to work because they both have yeah. the basic belief and it's not the same one, right? Yeah, that is a good question. Thank you, Philip, uh, a lot for your question. And your question is related with disagreement uh, and peer disagreement and disagreement among uh, many religions. So if there is disagreement among the religions, can belief in God be properly basic? That is the point. And my, my other project is uh, to see what are the main answers to, to disagreement. We have the steadfast position, we had the, the conciliatory position, uh, but I, I think that the disagreement thing is related with the defeaters and to the people answers to the defeaters. I need to think more about that, if it is rational to, to, to be steadfast in, in face of the disagreement among the religions. Uh, I have uh, strong intuitions for the steadfast position, but I need to argue more about it. And um, uh, yeah, I need to work more on, on, on such questions because it's, it's really essential in order to, to, to deal with defeaters and so on. Thank you a lot for, for, for your question because it's, it's the following point in my project. So if the knowledge first formed epistemology is correct, how to deal with uh, such a thing like disagreement and so on. Thank you for that. Thanks. Nicola, your microphone is off. Oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, as I was saying, we have room for another question uh, from David Garcia. Okay. Hi there. Hi. Are you going to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a pleasure finally to meet you. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, uh, maybe I missed something in your in your talk, but. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned the the role of perception in your yeah. in your presentation, right? But it wasn't it wasn't clear to me what you mean by perception and why I'm, I'm saying this. Because first of all, um, the role that perception plays in in knowledge is very discussed. And second of all, because the notion of perception is not as self-evident as uh, we commonly used to think, right? Especially mm -hmm. because of the, the work of, of Thomas Reed. He has yeah. a very, very nice job about perception, which is as good as complex. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, and also because in perception is also um, an epistemological value for scientific knowledge and common knowledge right mm -hmm. and in the religious case people use usually uh, 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 apply uh, uh, in, in the argument uh, the perception as, as, a, as a source for for a, some kind of justification right so they say look I can perceive God because of this and this and this and this and I can perceive the the ontological existence of God because of this, 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 and etc., etc. So, uh, so what do you mean by perception um, exactly? Yeah, well, my point. Yeah, that is a good question. Thank you, uh, David. My point is following. Uh, by perception, I mean the effective mental state of seeming or seeing seeing that p for example 
If I see that it's raining, then I have effective mental states, and that effective mental states, we can conclude that I know that it's raining. So perceiving that P is the same that seeing that P. So my point, and, uh, and uh, this notion of, uh, of perception is uh, a notion that uh, Timothy Williamson also accept. So, but my point in this talk is that is an externalist view of perception, right? Yeah, an externalist way. Of yeah. course, of course, it's an externalist view of 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 uh, of perception. So perception is affective mental state. So if if it is an affective mental state, it is an externalistic view of perception. Of course, of course. So, but my point in this talk is that. Uh, we can have an analogous to, to perception to, in a religious case. In a religious uh, cases, uh, if there is a God, we can have some kind of active mental state similar to perception in, in which uh, the, uh, the person, the religious person, uh, can have a disposition to have effective mental state of knowing that we, uh, for example, knowing that there is a God. For example, in uh, circumstances in which such a person have a religious experience or is praying and so on. The point is that there are uh, some uh, kind of uh, circumstances <coughs> There are some kind of circumstances, like reading the Bible or praying, in which the subjects uh, can form an effective mental state uh, of perceiving or knowing that there is a God. That is the point. So, if there is the effective mental state of, of seeing uh, that it is raining, I, I think we can have also um, effective mental state of uh, uh, perceiving uh, God or something like that, if there is a God. So in, in your case, so just a follow up, a follow up. Yeah. Uh, in your case, um, so what role uh, theories play in this externalist view of perception? For instance, let me give an example. Uh, if you have a person that it's behaving in a very weird way, like talking language that they that this person doesn't know, or I know un unknown language, right? Strange language, yeah. and and with different tones of voice and and, and, and etc. And behave in a very 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 weird way, non let's say non human way. And then we have an, once from one side a, a religious person they would say, well look, this person is really is clearly uh, possessed by a demon, and then. Yeah. Uh, at, this, at his at his side, her side, we have another person that would say, "Look, this is just a case of uh, double double personality uh, disorder, psychological disorder." Yeah, I see. So they both see the same thing, right? So yeah. Um, so which one has the? They would have the same perception of, of things, or the theory would play some role in in the perception. Yeah. Or no, I, or don't. I, I think we need to to make. Uh, a distinction because we need to distinguish among good cases in which there is really a perception of bad cases in which we do not have the perception but only hallucination or so on. So in an externalist theory like Timothy Wilson develop, it is needed to, to distinguish uh, good cases than bad cases. And in a religious thing we, we also can distinguish good cases of bad cases. We can say that in a good case in which there is a God, there is really um, um, effective mental state of perceiving that there is a God, and so there is knowledge of God. But in a bad case, uh, there is only hallucination, for example. But if the person have no defeaters and so on, if the persons have the same phenomenology, we can say that such a person have some kind of excuse to continue to believe in God in a basic way. That is the point. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, thanks a lot, a lot for your question. <clears throat>
Okay, we're running uh, late, so I'm afraid this is the last question, unfortunately. I mean, I know it's quite interesting, so you can read it in the chat. If I understand, understand well, you said that you are justified or excused to have uh, theological beliefs because there is a religious or spiritual phenomenon that may, maybe is working behind the formation of those beliefs. Yeah. Can you tell more about the nature of religious experience? Yeah, the religious experience that I am thinking about are the common uh, religious experience, like uh, praying, like reading the Bible, like in attending the mass, like you see the, the beauty of nature and so on. So I want to, yeah, I have in mind only uh, common religious experience like praying and so on. Um, so uh, such a religious experience can, can yeah, are formed, formed by our ordinary experience of praying and so on. There is no something supernatural about that. But if you have a good case in which there is a God, then God can create us with the disposition to, to form effective mental state that in uh, some circumstance, like a circumstance of uh, reading the Bible or uh, the pray, we can form the, or produce effective mental state of belief that there is a God without argument, without the ontological argument or, or, or so on. That is the main point. So I, I am, yeah, I am, I, I, I understand. Yeah, I am understanding. Understood. Yeah, I, I understood the, the religious experience in a more basic way and common way. So for me, for example, praying is a, a kind of ordinary religious experience. <laughs> I'm not in thinking about mystical experiences or so or so on. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. So. Thanks again for your talk. I mean, lots of questions. Uh, I'm sorry when to stop the discussion, but we have a lot of, uh, I mean, we're on tight schedule, unfortunately. So thanks again. And uh, okay, now. Thanks so much.